Welcome everyone to the Indo-American Art Council Literary Festival. This year, we celebrate our sixth year of bringing you authors, thought leaders, and storytellers from around the world. Many of these stories originate from the Indian subcontinent, and today we celebrate these voices that have been shaped by the Indian ethos and experience. In these unprecedented times, our collective shared experiences have uplifted us and have reshaped our perspectives. For our 2020 festival, we invite our authors to take center stage to bring people together through the art of storytelling. Moderating the session for today for the book, Mistranslations, Meeting the Immigrant Parents Who Raised Me, is Ms. Arthi Varani. Arthi is an arts and culture writer who is steered by curiosity, empathy, and cross-cultural communication. Her work frequently appears in the Wall Street Journal, Surface, and CNN.com. She's also the contributing editor for Vogue India. Our spotlight tonight is on the book Mistranslations uh, by author and New York-based comedian Sopan Deb. Deb is a writer for the New York Times, and before joining the Times, he covered the Donald Trump presidential campaign for CBS News. Welcome. Welcome, Arthi. Welcome, Sopan. Thank you, Neely. I Thank you for having me. Thanks for yes, having me. And, and with that, um, Arthi, I invite you to open up this evening's session. All right. Sopan, I am so looking forward to speaking with you. Thanks again, Neely. I know we're professionally acquainted through the South Asian Journalists Association, a nonprofit that we've both been pretty active in. And I've been reading your reports for The Times for, for a while now. But for the moment, let's zoom into your baby, your book, <laughs> these translations. Um, so one of my favorite reviews of the book, which came from Kirkus, I believed, uh, I believe described it as a sympathetic portrait of South Asians who are neither crazy and rich nor humorless nerds. <laughs> to me personally, um, the book was a masterclass in vulnerability and empathy and vulnerability, as they say, is a prerequisite for courage, which you show in just incredible amounts throughout the story. But let's let's offer a brief recap of, of the book itself before we jump into the talk. So Mistranslations is a bittersweet autobiographical account of reuniting with your family. When you began writing this book, Sopan, as I understand it, you hadn't seen your father who had moved back to India from the United States in over 11 years and hadn't spoken to your mother in over two years, if that's correct. Uh, five, um, closer to five years, but yeah. Closer to five years, okay. So you were raised by first-generation Indian immigrants in suburban New Jersey, and you kind of grew up yearning for, for this kind of tight-knit home environment that you saw some of your white friends experiencing, and yet your own parents' rocky marriage, in addition to each of their uneasy relationship with life in the United States, which you discuss in poignant details throughout the book, meant that you were never really able to get to know them as individuals. And in one of the book's rawest moments, you write that by the time you came along, by the time you were born, your parents' distaste for each other was, and I quote, ingrained into the fabric of the household. So, you know, with that as sort of the backdrop, I guess take us back to, to the origins of, of this memoir. You're approaching your 30th birthday, you're a journalist by day, you're practicing stand-up on the side, but you are estranged from your parents and you begin to acknowledge that you're feeling pretty disconnected from some of the material that you're performing on stage. Um, in the book, you describe it as, um, you know, the incongruity of talking about being brown while avoiding my brownness nagged at me. So for starters, I was hoping you could expand on that sense of disconnect for us and, and tell us how that very personal struggle evolved into the idea for a book. Um, sure. So basically, you know, I was turning 30, as you said, and I hadn't seen my dad in 11 years, my mom in five. Um, and just to give the listeners here an understanding, I literally didn't know the first thing about them. I didn't know their birthdays, how old they were, where they were living at the time, how they met, how they came to this country, um, you know, what they were like as children, what their aspirations were. I didn't know anything about them. And so, so I was turning 30. And I, I didn't want it to be too late. I didn't, I didn't want, essentially, if, if you were to ask me what the core message, reason was for writing the book, it was that I didn't want my parents to die 
without me, without passing on their stories to me on some level. And so that was part of it. I mean, and secondly, I couldn't live with the guilt that they were both living alone on opposite sides of the globe. And so I wanted to reconnect with them on some uh, on some level. And as far as how um, stand-up comedy factored into it, um, you know, I, I, I have been doing stand-up on and off for now, you know, uh, 10 years or so, maybe, maybe a little less. And uh, I realized I was doing a lot of brown material on stage, you know, uh, a lot of low-hanging jokes mm-hmm. that, didn't feel right to me, didn't feel comfortable. They were getting laughs from the audience, but didn't feel genuine talking about it because I spent my whole life, my whole life until semi-recently, running away from being brown. I grew up around mostly white people. I rejected Hinduism because my parents had such a bad marriage and they were arranged to get married, married and I thought to myself, well, how could I you know, subscribe to this world? And, and so, but then, you know, when I got on stage, I started talking about, I felt very comfortable talking about brownness and talking about what it meant to be brown. And and so part of this journey was also to, as much as it was to find my parents, it was also a journey to find myself. And um, so I feel much differently about it now. Yeah. Um, I guess expanding on on just sort of the myths and 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 the content that, that steered much of your stand-up comedy, which you're quite passionate about. You know, in the book, you acknowledge that, um, again, I'm quoting, you said, talking about any version of the brown experience felt cathartic, whether it was the mangled one of my childhood or the way I imagined a happy brown kid growing up. And I'm wondering where where are these happy brown kid myths coming from for you at that point? You know, you, I guess, yeah, for starters, just where were the myths coming from? Well, when I was in, in the first half of my childhood, I grew up in a very vibrant Bengali community. And so I grew up around, a bu- uh, uh, you know, it, at least in the first half of my childhood, I grew up around a bunch of Bengali children that I was very, you know, was friends with. And I'd see what their relationships like were with their parents. And so, and it wasn't like my relationship with my parents. Um, so oftentimes I, I'd see them interacting with family and their parents and the lives they were living. I'd go, oh, wow. So. It is possible to have a happy life while being Indian. I don't know what that's like, but that seems interesting. So oftentimes when I would go on stage, I would be um, kind of portraying their lives and not and not mine. Um, but either way, that it felt more comfortable talking about being when I first, let me put it this way. When I first started doing stand up, I, I was trying to be like Jerry Seinfeld or Mitch Hedberg and trying to do like um, kind of observational humor, like what's the deal with airline tickets, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And I felt even talking about some semblance of the Brown experience, whether it was like the projected one I saw of my friends or, you know, some some version alluding to mine, that felt more comfortable. It felt more honest, even though it was in its own way dishonest because it wasn't so all the time my experience. So, um, and, and that's where the incongruity was, right? And so that was partially why I wanted to reach back out to my parents so I could learn about my roots because, you know, I want to feel more honest on stage. Yeah. And I think I think that idea of just being happy to tell any brown story on stage speaks to just the lack of brown stories there are out there. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, do you feel like there's been an evolution in terms of, you know, just there being a more pluralistic view of what a South Asian immigrant experience might look like, would you say there's been growth? Growth, but there's still a lot of room to grow. I mean, so we've seen, so when I was growing up, one of the most profound movies I've ever seen was uh, in 2006, I think it was, it was The Namesake. The Namesake to me was a profound film based on the Jhupa Lahiri novel, which is also a profound novel. And as a Bengali kid, it was the first time I'd ever seen a, a, a Bengali story told on television, um, or, or film, actually, in this case. Yeah. And now you have it. Now it's now it's a little bit more common, right? You have the Never Have I Ever, you know, Mindy Kaling. You have Jupiter, you know, Jupiter novels. You have um, Kumail Nanjiani's doing a um, a Marvel movie. You have um, you know he did The Big Sick. You have uh, that movie Yesterday. You had. Um, uh, the Bruce Springsteen movie, which I'm forgetting the name of it. Name Blinded of it, by the Light. Blinded by the Light, thank you, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, The Night Of, you have all kinds of, there's a little bit, there's a little bit more of a South Asian, you know, uh, uh, you know, Hassan Minhaj doing the Patriot Act, 
there, there's more out there. There's a lot more. There's a lot more to go. And and the reason you know that there's a lot more to go is that, and I thought about this a lot with the discourse surrounding Never Have I Ever. Um, you know, there are a lot of. I, I saw a decent amount of criticism from the Brown community that were like watching Never Have I Ever and say, well, you know what, that is not my story. You know, that doesn't represent me. I don't have. I I don't identify with the main character Debbie. Like this is this is not this is not good. You know, <laughs> and and it goes you. It tells you um, kind of how little brown content there is because every time there is a significant piece of brown content whether it's a book uh uh tv a movie podcast you name it there's a pressure for that piece of content to be everything to everyone mm. but that same burden is not on you know white you know white driven content so for example you know, you saw Indian matchmaking. You know, there's a significant amount of brown people that were offended by Indian matchmaking. Be like, well, look at how our culture is being portrayed to the world. You don't hear like white people go, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians. You know, what are people going to think of us now? And it's like that's not. Yeah. You know, let, let us have our bad television too. You know. Right. Um, so so um, anyway, so to answer your, that's a long way of answering your question is that there's been growth. It's just that there's a long way to go. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really important distinction to make and articulate. And um, yeah, that the kind of burden that's placed on a lot of South Asian storytelling to be everything for everybody is is unfair. And honestly, it would be an inauthentic piece of art if it was attempting to do that, right? To, to totally, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and when I wrote Mistranslations, I, I, I probably read it a thousand times trying to make sure I did that the, the 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 people that look like me reading this would not walk away feeling like they were insulted and um and I try that was really a big mission of mine to make sure that um I did not um you know that I didn't like do I, I didn't punch down does that make sense Cause, yeah, because histor historically, you know, the way brown people have been um, uh, portrayed in culture, you know, is, you know, they're terrorists or they're cab drivers and they're very one note. You know, there's very little nuance given to them. And, and I did not want that to be the um, that that to be the takeaway from people reading this book. Yeah, and I, I it certainly came across for, for me. And, you know, I think much of this book is this quest for you to find some kind of common ground with your parents. And I was reminded of the idea that it's difficult to hold negative thoughts for feeling for negative feelings for people once you're close to them, because you often see yourself in them. And especially after the elections we've just had, um, it made me think about the rift that's forming between so many communities here in the United States and whether your book might offer some tools on, on a granular level um, in terms of reaching out to individuals whom we feel like we share zero common ground with, do you find that you've become better at this since going through this journey with your parents? Um, it's a good question. Um, I don't know that I've thought about it on that granular level. I, I do think that a journey requires you, like this, requires you to be... Um, uh, have have an intense amount of empathy and 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 it really requires you to be able to look in the mirror and say hey what what am i bringing to the table here and so how has the book experience changed me it has made my parents way more human in my in my um in my life they're not just distant footnotes and it has also made me it's given me a greater appreciation for what the generation before us you know what um it has made me. It has made me give me a greater appreciation for what that generation went through to get here and to survive here. You know, I grew up in middle class New Jersey. You know, I, and and yes, my childhood wasn't ideal in many ways, but I still had a lot of privilege that I didn't realize. Like the house that you know my parents, that my dad got, you know, as an as an electrical engineer, he couldn't dream of living in a in a house with bedrooms growing up. You know, he 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 took me over to the apartment he lived in growing up. I don't think he ever saw himself living in a house like that, you know. Um, so in, in 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 I have become more, I would say, more empathetic in that period. Has it made, has the election affected that? That I don't know. That that I don't know. Um, because because when it comes to empathy following the election, I feel like 
it's it's not a universal trait, as in the people that are asked to have empathy and the people that are on the receiving end of empathy often aren't the ones doling out the empathy. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, because I read the book in the climate of the elections, it was hard not to make, you know, it was not hard not to connect the dots, but I, I do see what you're saying. Um, you know, as, while reading this, I also couldn't help but just constantly draw parallels between an immigrant's journey and the idea of improv um, both on some level are about creating new worlds from scratch, right? And, and mm. dreaming and, and um, I just feel like to, to continue with what we were talking about uh, in terms of like exercising empathy, tell us a little bit about some of the unexpected traits that you found that you shared with your parents, um, despite feeling like you hadn't gotten the opportunity to bond with them as a child. And, and there were many as I read yeah. the book. Yeah. Uh, my favorite one, was with my father, who um, we get to his flat in Kolkata where he lives, and, and he has all these paintings hanging on the walls. And, and there are these famous paintings, and but they look a little different. And my dad says, yeah, yeah, these are paintings I, I had commissioned. And uh, it's like one of them is like the Last Supper. And, and my dad was so outraged at the original paintings being historically inaccurate that he wants to commission factually correct versions of them. So he has the like five or six paintings in his room. One of them is The Last Supper of like, uh, in The Last Supper, for example, I, and I, I'm, I might be mangling my, my facts here, but but he uh, he has them bare feet. And I think they're wearing sandals in, in, in The Last Supper and, and in the original Last Supper. And, and because he's like, well, Jesus Christ would, you know, if, if Jesus Christ had washed my foot, I would never put on sandals. And it was like, that's hilarious. But also, you know, I'm that guy who's watching films and pointing out plot holes. As a journalist, right, you and I both are taught yeah. to be skeptical and cynical and, and point out factual inaccuracies and fact check stuff. And I was like, uh, you know, my dad, you know, was kind of similar in that respect. So that was one thing um, that, I, I, that I found very funny. You know, my dad told me that I got my sense of humor from him, which I thought was very funny uh, yeah. because... Uh, uh, I'd never found my dad particularly funny, and here I am, a stand-up comic, and he's telling me <laughs> that I got him. So, um, yeah, no, there was a lot. There's a lot, you know, in the course of the book, I, I we find, in that process, I found out that I, I shared a lot with my parents that I didn't previously realize. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I keep thinking back on the anecdote, um, and I, I know I'm pointing to a lot of examples that, that relate to your father. There's no shortage of incidents with your mother, but maybe something about... The, the dramaticness of the travel to India makes these kind of memories stand out more to me. Uh, but I'm thinking of uh, the the morning tennis session with your yeah. father, which you avoided a little bit, and then you get around to it. And and it was so layered because there was an element of myth to that whole thing because you know you've kind of built up your father as a figure who's played tennis for for you know a while and, and you presume he's you know a solid tennis player and t walk us through that tell us a little yeah. bit about what happened there well the context here is that i grew up in a mostly white town of Howell, new jersey and all my all my friends dads were like playing sports with them right like playing catch with them playing you know basketball or coaching them in little league or whatever and i never had that with my dad my dad never understood any of that stuff i was a big, a big basketball fan my dad didn't even know what basketball was and so uh and then when I last saw him before this trip, it was uh, my, my freshman year of college, and my and and he looked kind of old and beat up and kind of haggard. He looked stressed and depressed, and he didn't look well. He didn't look healthy, it, as if as if he looked he looked defeated. And then he got up and moved to India. I didn't tell anybody. That was last. I didn't know that was the last time I was going to see him. Um, it just ended up being the case. And then eleven years later. I get out of the airport in Kolkata, and I thought I would see that version of my father, except 11 years worse. Instead, what happens is my dad looks very, very energetic. His arms are toned. He looks healthy. He looks trim. He's got more hair than I do. Like, he's doing really, really well for himself. And then he's talking about how he plays tennis three or four times a week. He play, wakes up at 6 a.m. He goes. He's in great shape, and he, he has a, he's had a coach for the ten, last 10 years. And so... I challenge him to a match. Now, I haven't played tennis since I was like eight. I'm terrible. I'm not a good athlete. 
I, I, I'm awful. I just want to have this moment of playing sports with my dad because I never had that. And he was delighted. And I was like, Dad, I'm not very good. And he says, um, don't worry. You don't have to be good to play with your father. You know, we'll just hit some balls around. Mm. You know, I'm expecting him to hit serves and four, forehands and backhands and me running all over the courts, flailing. And then when we start playing on this court and my dad had, um, you know, rented from the facility. We, we had a ball boy. I mean, he was awful. I mean, he was a terrible player. I mean, I was bad, but I had an excuse to be bad. He was awful. And we were both just hitting balls all over the place, and the poor ball boy got a more of a workout than we did. <laughs> and it was, um, I mean, it was a wonderful, fun experience. It was just, I was just wondering the whole time, well, what is, who is this coach that has been taking money from my dad? Um, but uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, it, was, it was something I'll never forget. We have video from it and whatnot. Um, 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 you know, and so I hope, um, you know, I think it's something my dad will remember forever. We have pictures after we, you know, but it was, it was, it was a sight for sore eyes. I'll put it that way. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think, and that's another thing that makes this book so endearing and relatable is that there are these very specific moments kind of wrapped up in, in insight and, and, you know, um, just wider observations about cultural differences. There's, there's an especially insightful paragraph you devote to the very American idea of choice and how it was a foreign concept for your parents to grasp and how that little seed of culture shock was somewhat responsible for the gulf that continued to form between you all. Um, you write, you know, choice is a ubiquitous concept for Western children. I don't mean that in a preachy, rah-rah, let's celebrate America and freedom on July 4th with Lee Greenwood kind of way. Freedom is great, of course but it's different than what I'm referring to. This is about choice, the agency to have a space, independent of familial pressures to pursue your own fulfillment. It's unlike anything with which my parents were familiar. So, you know, you've, and like spoiler alert a little bit for every, anybody who's yet to read the book, you've rebuilt bridges or in the process of rebuilding bridges with your folks since writing this book. But I'm wondering how you all continue to navigate this particular difference of opinion when it comes to, to choice. Um, I don't know that it's a difference of opinion as much as it is a difference in upbringing. Like, I think my parents grew up in India and had less choices available to them. Choices that you and I take for granted here in the U.S. Um, my mother wasn't given a choice as far as like, who she was going to marry. My dad wasn't given a choice as to what he would study in school. You know, um, the patriarchy just reigned so supreme in, in, in that generation. Um, so for me, you know, I, if I, I, you know, when I was growing up and if, you know, in my, in my twenties, let's say if, if I saw, you know, a, a woman, you know, that I met that I want to go out, ask on a date, I can go do that. You know, my mom never really had that freedom, you know, and that, that, that kind of the, the concept of agency is, is, is very different. Now, how has that changed after, after the book? It hasn't really. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think that, once you once you reach a certain age, you who who you are is who you are. And and for my parents who are now in their late seventies, early eighties, you know, they are who they are, you know, and and um do they have I, they're not gonna suddenly see you know yeah. there's a generational difference, there's a cultural difference. They, there's all kind of gaps there that I, I, they're not suddenly going to change their outlook, but um uh, you know, but it, it gave me an appreciation for the world that they came from. Yeah. Um, I'm also wondering how just, and, and I want to, you know, as a fellow journalist, I kind of want to geek out a little bit about the process of writing this book because I found that so fascinating. But um, there's been this linkage between people who end up being journalists and people who kind of feel like outsiders in their lives a little bit, right? Like there's plenty mm -hmm. of great storytellers who, took that observer status and then channeled it into a career. Um, and I'm wondering how much of that rings true for you. Um, that's a great question. I've always wondered why I decided to become a journalist. And, I, and I've, I've always wondered whether it's, it's partially because I've always felt like an outsider growing up. But like, I'm not the only, the thing is though, journalists, you know, in some ways are not diverse or not as diverse as they should be. But many of them get into this for different reasons. You know, some, sure. of, some of them, you know, some of them, um, you know, come from, 
many, I would actually say, come from wealthy backgrounds and they're, you know, uh, and and they were always part of the in crowd or whatever, you know. So, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not saying there isn't a link between my kind of feelings of cultural alienation growing up and my choice to be a journalist that way. I've just never thought about it the way, thought about it the way. The reason I became a journalist is because, A, I enjoy storytelling, you know, and uh, B, I think journalism is the easiest route to meeting new people, talking to them, and 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 being creative as as much as much as you can be, um, and that's why I started doing it. Um, you know, I was never an academic type. A lot of professions are academic, and I don't like college. I mean, I I don't like college classes. I'm not good at test taking. You know, uh, I don't have much of an attention span for to sit through you know research papers and whatnot. And I thought. You know what? Journals is the next best, the next best thing. Yeah, and so when it came to, you know, you you no doubt took a lot of, a lot of the tools that that you had gained from your journalism background, um, as you told this particular story. And it sounds like a lot of the difficult and sensitive conversations that unfolded between you and your parents happened in the presence of a tape recorder. Mm-hmm. And you know, you yourself write that at times you could. Start, you could feel your blood to start to simmer and your journalistic veneer melt away. Um, what was that like balancing your identity as a son and a journalist, uh, especially as, as the skeletons were kind of tumbling out of the family closet? Well, I, I made a decision early on that I was going to approach this not as my parents' son, uh, but as a journalist. And the reason for that is I felt like I need to approach this with as much distance as much distance from my own preconceived notions as possible. Because this way, when the conversations get difficult, I would immediately get defensive. It would allow me to have more empathy. It would allow me to have, kind of see see their sides of it, side of it a little bit more. Um, because I think a process like this, as I said before, it requires a great deal of looking in the mirror and, and self-introspection. And I felt like if I came at it as like a quote unquote unbiased journalist, I can do that a lot easier. Um, now, there is a limit to how much of that was possible, given that they are your parents, and there are all these wounds that exist and and these sores that are being ripped open by these conversations. There, there, there's there's a limit to that, and that was tested in these conversations, which became very difficult with both of my parents. Um, but ultimately, I think the initial approach is what allowed the later conversations to happen. You know, I mean, I remember my first question to each of my parents was what their birthday was, what, what how wow. old. Were and and because I didn't know, but that was me asking as a journalist. Cause I literally need your biographical information if I'm going to do this, you know. And 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 ha- and starting the conversation off that way kind of kind of allowed us to warm up and allowed us to kind of you know circle each other a little bit. And then um and then we got to the harder stuff much later. I mean, I thought it was it was amazing that for a long time, as you were interviewing your father, um, he was under the impression that you were writing a book. On India, and he kind of kept yeah. bringing it to that. So, do you can you walk us through what it was like when? Because I, I think there was a moment or several moments where he realized that no, this is beyond that. Like, what was what was that realization but, like? You know, my father, <laughs> my dad kept thinking I was writing a book on like the history of India, like the the, Mug- right. the Mughals. You know, um, I don't think that he understood at first what I was trying to do. And the reason for that, I think, is is it goes back to kind of a, um, you know, you and I both know a lot of South Asians uh, in the generation before us. They don't they don't talk about deep emotional stuff, you know. They don't talk about um, feelings, and 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 they certainly don't put it in a book for other people to read about. Um, so, so I think it was a little bit incomprehensible to both right. of my parents that what I was proposing to them. And it wasn't until I think I actually did it and we had these conversations that we actually, um, and then they finally read the book in manuscript form that they under, oh, this is what you were doing. Oh, you know, oh my goodness. Um, this, I was not expecting this. So yeah. it was a little bit of a journey, but, you know, we eventually got there. Yeah, and, you know, I, I definitely want to talk about their reactions to the manuscript, given that it's, I don't know, like you said, it's such a, a groundbreaking thing to do, not not only to tell your story, but to tell it to a wide audience. Um, so, you know, what 
were you surprised by their reactions? Um, they both had very complicated reactions. Um, look, if, if, you know, there's four members of our family. There's my brother who's 10 years older than me and, and, uh, and, and, and my parents. So there's four of us. If all four of us wrote our individual versions of mistranslations, it would be four totally different books with four very different interpretations of the same events. And all four of us, you know, the other three would be angry about certain characterizations, right? And so for my parents, it was very difficult to see this laid out in print. Now, with that being said, they eventually, um, they came around. They understood what I was trying to do after a while. And, and um, my mom in particular, you know, when the book came out and she saw the reviews and she started getting calls from, you know, aunties and uncles being like, oh my gosh, you know, she was like, oh, wow, this is quite nice. My dad had a great reaction, actually. My dad had the best one. My dad, um, he reads the manuscript at first, you know, he took issue with stuff and whatever, you know, we got through that. And then he goes, so Pan, you've written a book. That's so exciting. I'm proud of you. What an accomplishment. You've inspired me. I'm going to write my own book. It's going to be called My Life, The Untold Story. You know, I'm like, okay, Dad, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Everyone says they're going to write their memoirs. And, you know, six months later, my dad, well, I get an email from my dad, and he, he sends me a, a Word document with like 65, 75,000 words. He actually wrote a memoir about himself. And it's incredibly detailed. It's incredibly rich. He's like, I want you to, you know, pass this on to you. I want you to rewrite it in however way you want because I'm not very good at English. Write whatever you want but I want you to have this and you can pass it on to your children when I'm gone. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, and he actually, he actually, he took my book as inspiration to write his own book. That's amazing. I mean, that, talk about healing, right? Like for everybody, yeah. what, a, what better example could there be? Um, and what, you know, what is your connection with them like now how, in terms of how often you connect or speak or, you know, yeah. I, I'm sure there's an um, evolution to that. There is an evolution. You know, look, you know, as I, as I write the book, this is not a Hallmark movie where, like, everything's better overnight. Um, yeah. It's a process. You know, there are ups, there are downs, there are peaks and valleys. Um, I would say that there's certainly more of a presence in my life than they were before. I mean, they were zero. There was no presence. Now, you know, I, you know, my, I, you know, I, I, you know I t my mother and father, we, you know, we are in contact. You know, we are, you know, they're, you know, do we talk every day? No, you know. Um, I don't think that's ever going to be the case, but we are in contact and we are, you know, we have a relationship and, you know, they, they are aware of what's going on in my life. Um, I, I wrote a novel over the summer and they were the first people I sent the novel to, you know, um, and, and that is, uh, you know, and, and so they, they, they are, they're my parents, whereas before they were footnotes in my life you know now they're my parents and 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 that's the evolution now are there are there times when things are difficult yeah there are there are challenges you know um but you know we work on those in the past we didn't work on them yeah and you know like you said they're your parents they're they've kind of stepped into that to that role of being your parents as difficult as things can sometimes be um right. congrats on on finishing a second book is there anything you can tell us uh we i just finished it um I hope to have news on it very shortly. I don't have it right now. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, I think we're, we're pretty close to uh, the end of our time together. Um, thank you again for your openness and, and for telling such an articulate story. Um, and, uh, it's a oh, necessary well, read. Before we go, oh, uh, thank you for taking the time, uh, you know, out of your day to do this. It really means a lot to me uh, that you would, you know, first of all, that you read the book and to take the time to, you know, engage with me on this. And uh, my thanks to the festival for ha having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks again. And I'm, I'm going to turn things to Neely Lakani, festival director. Thank you so much. Thank you, RC, for moderating today's session. Sopan, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing such a personal story, story with our audience. Um, I think that there's there's so many of us in our 30s and 40s who are first generation Indians. And I believe that, you know, it takes one to know one, a certain type of, um, I think it, that experience has shaped an entire generation of being first generation. Um, 
And I think that your story is going to resonate so much with uh, the Indian diaspora, especially in, in this, this area. So I wanted to thank you on behalf of the Indo-American Arts Council today for sharing your story. And anything else we can, you'd like to share? Um, where, can, where can somebody see you? Are you still performing? Uh, not since the pandemic, and mostly, honestly, uh, I, I I have been writing. You know, I wrote the I wrote another book over the summer, and you know, focusing on like you know pilots and screenplays and stuff like that. So, but because of the pandemic, I, I haven't really done much since then. I did a couple like Zoom shows here and there, but nothing uh, too notable. But um, you know, if you have people, you know, I'm, I'm still writing for the Times. I still have my day job, so um, I'm I you know people can read me there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sop, and thank you, Arati. And this concludes our session for today. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, I'm Neely Lakandi, IAC Literary Festival Director. I want to thank you for joining our award-winning authors and their wondrous stories. IAC is a 501c nonprofit. Programs like the one you just watched happen because of contributions from generous folks like you. Please donate to the IAC so that we can support our artists and sustain our cultural programs. It is simple to donate by visiting the IAC website at iaac.us. Learn about the insider benefits that membership gives you. On behalf of the entire IAC board, stay safe and see you at our next event. Thank you.